There we go. Eight o'clock, or a little bit before eight o'clock. We'll wait for a few people to start uh, joining. Uh, magnificent day here in Cape Town. Uh, not the best place in the world to be when it's, the weather's so great. I'd rather be in a cold, snowy, rainy place then it wouldn't be so much fun. But now it's absolutely magnificent. Yeah, in, in the foothills of the Table Mountain, a lot of fun. So I can see the people are joining fast and furiously. Um, we'll wait a few minutes. I'm gonna go through what we've been up to in this lockdown. As you know, I was lucky. I had a prelude to this uh, lockdown and that uh, when you get cancer, it's like a lockdown. There's no more, um, doing your normal life, you know, you just suddenly, it just gets taken away from you and you realize, listen, there's more important things in life than paddling all the time and uh, swimming and doing those, although they're the most fun things I like doing, but when you have cancer, things change. You can't just plan your life straight away. It, all that happens is that it straight away stops and you reassess the situation. Just like this COVID-19, you can imagine uh, a lot of people are a bit upset not, in, not being able to train, not be able to get outside. In, in South Africa, you're not allowed to even visit friends. I'm in this apartment block that's on the ninth story. And uh, it's fun being here with Claire, getting a bit of time together. The many years, the 40 or 50 years, well, we've been together. How many years, Claire? 30. Been together 37 years. And of those 37 years, I can assure you that Claire was always um, at home by herself many times with the children while I was out around the world teaching and, and racing and, and doing those and, and now Claire's got a lot of time to spend uh, uh, looking after me and, and like the king and uh, she's doing a fantastic job feeding me correctly which is that's another thing I'll talk about and then we'll go into a proper lesson and then after the lesson uh, we will do some uh, questions and answers. So before uh, my camera lady is ready here, all ready, <laughs> it's Claire all ready. Can you see? Where are you? Claire? Oh, there you are. There's Claire ready. So she's going to take over to turn this thing around. And then we're going to start going. We've got uh, 62 people online. There you are, Claire. Turn that around. Name a few names there. Um, who forgot that you know there, Claire? I saw Morel down. She's down the road. Morel Ellis Brown. She's on online, Dr. girls. Uh, Philip Paris Brown is Philip, on. Philip, all the way from uh, Aladdin. Fred Taylor, Jay Rose. Jay Rose, all the way from Florida. Mark Hodnett, Michael. Michael who? McCoch. McKeo, Michael McKeo from Australia. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. First thing we're going to go through, I mean, and, and this is the, the tough part in this uh, lockdown, I know in Australia and in South Africa it's really tough, is that what do you do? What do you do when you're locked up in an apartment like this? The biggest problem is, is the fridge. The fridge causes a lot of problems because I can assure you after two or three or four weeks, we never know how long this lockdown. We're on day, basically day seven, actually we're on day seven because uh, we started uh, Thursday night. So this is our last, uh, our first week. Is that a lot of people are having problems with walking past the fridge and, 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 and organizing their day. I think this is the best opportunity to educate yourself what to eat. Because this, I don't care what anybody said, I've done so much research. Again, don't ask me, go and educate yourself. Is the way we're eating keto. So what happened was, Claire sneaked in a few, um, a few treats. A little bit of ice cream and a little bit of rusks. South Africans love rusks. And lo and behold, those little rusks just put the little weight coming up a little bit. So those are gone. So now we only eat keto. We're eating once a day, a magnificent meal that takes about three hours to prepare. Claire doesn't really take that long, but we, we stretch out the preparation and we only have fat and protein with very little carbs. The carbs that we are having is the wine. How's the wine collection? Can you see it's hiding there, but it's getting fairly low. <laughs> it's getting fairly low. I'm a bit worried because there's a ban on alcohol. There's a ban on alcohol. Um, uh, purchasing and even transporting alcohol. So that's a small problem that we, uh, we're going to encounter. So our carbohydrates is our wine, no beer. And funny enough, we haven't put on, I haven't put on one kilogram and you're supposed to lose weight when you're having chemo and things like that. But I, I've kept my weight constant. In fact, I went up, which is bad. So tomorrow is chemo day, Friday. And so I get to drive out to Constantia Berg Hospital 
had my chemo for two and a half hours or so, and I'm sure Kay will then shop for Vital Essentials. My best snack now, you know, everybody has biscuits and these crisps. Get rid of those. Those things are bad. I mean, there's more sugar in those crisps and, 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 and biscuits than you can ever believe. I have cucumber, gherkins, gherkins with cheese on it. It's the best snack. So we love that. Now, to fill up your day, it becomes difficult. The, the series you're watching is Mad Men, which is quite fun. Haven't got through it because you're busy watching the news, seeing what's happening in the COVID uh, uh, disaster. And then we read. Obviously, you can read. At the moment, this is a fantastic book. The Obstacle is the Way. So that is a great title, The Obstacle is the Way, which actually means that you can either take this obstacle on and actually make it a positive, like we have now, the COVID uh, problem at the moment, uh, rather make it in a positive than a negative. So the obstacle can be, obviously an obstacle is something in the way, but make that a positive. The other thing we're doing is listening to an audio book. It's called uh, Real Food on Trial. Fantastic book about how Tim Noakes, because of his, uh, because he, he told the guys, listen, fat is good and carbs bad, uh, the, the South African Medi Medical and Dental Council took him on and then they lost the, the, the court case. Then they went on appeal and lost it again. So it's a fantastic book on how that all uh, uh, panned out. It was, it's a four-year trial, which is a long trial and a lot of uh, anguish for Tim Noakes. But at the end of the day, he wrote a book and it's an audio book. Audio books are quite fun. You sit here uh, preparing your dinner and uh, listening to the audio books. You put the TV off. And off you go. So, and there's a lot of things to do. I mean, planning in this, op this, this opportunity here. I mean, obviously here you are watching an online uh, uh, lesson and, and it's a lot of fun. You're learning something. Educate yourself. You've got a lot of time. All those things that you thought you'll never do. My pet hate is on my phone. I've got, if I've missed an email or missed an SMS or missed a WhatsApp, somebody messaging me, I've got no numbers on my phone, so I make sure that my phone is absolutely clean. And this is the opportunity to clean your phone out. All the old emails that you're supposed to listen to, you either read them or delete them. But no numbers on your phone. So I've been doing that, and, and it's always completely clean. So Claire, how many people we've got for the start of this lesson? Well, it tell, doesn't count up all the it numbers. It in the top, right, the top left. 83. Okay, so 83 people at the moment are watching live to see how we improve our paddling. So the reason why I'm still paddling is because it's such a fun sport, but the reason why you do it at the higher level or the beginner's level or whatever is because you've got to make it something part of your life. My dad at 82, he's a, also in a, in, a, he's in a gated village which we actually allowed to like an old age, home, not that he's 82 and old, and he's paddling and cycling and doing all the things uh, that you can do, where here we can do nothing, all we can do is walk up and down the steps, which we've been quite slack, we haven't had enough time to do it, you know, it's very difficult in these times where you've got so much time, you haven't got enough time to walk up and down the steps, do it once a day, once a day nine floors, and that's enough, that's enough exercise, remember, you can never outrun a bad diet, so eat the right food and you won't put any weight on and, and you'll still feel a lot better. So, the sport of paddling, uh, as I covered in the, in the last uh, video, I just covered the way you hold the paddle is, is um, at 90 degrees and why you hold it. Remember everything I teach you today and in the future uh, lessons is that everything has been thought out properly. This is not because I think it's, I first check it out, work it out and then explain how to, to make it work for you. Okay, so holding it at 90 degrees, the reason why we hold it at 90 degrees as opposed to shoulder width. Shoulder width, you end up padding like this, where there's no body. Here, the only way to get to the same place is to rotate. So it forces us to rotate. And again, this is where you do your first push-up, your first pull-up. That's simple. That's why you hold it. The next thing we covered is that all paddle sports, this paddle is bent down so that we don't go past vertical. So the, sh the blade doesn't go past vertical, but the shaft can go past vertical. Okay. And remember the three things that cause your paddle to go past vertical, pulling with your arm, pushing with your top hand, and dropping your top hand. Dropping that top hand. Dropping that top hand makes this paddle go past vertical. Okay, now we're going to go to a few more basics. And I've got this beautiful uh, surf ski here. 
Oh, on the Sersky side of it, it's quite interesting to know for those people out there that uh, worry about if they've bought new boats or new Sirskis, at Nello, and there was a big article in the local newspaper, they're working flat out. But they're working smart. All the workers, there's 200 workers in the factory of 20,000 square meters at Nello. All the workers have been split into four shifts. So only 50 people in a 20,000 square meter factory. So they're, they're not very close. They're practicing social distancing and they've all got masks, just about a full hazmat suit set. We're not infecting each other. They're monitoring it all the time. In the office staff, which is a huge office, there's only three people in the office. The rest are working from home, uh, like Bailey designing and, and Daniel, Daniel are designing, and, and you can design on, on their computer at home. So when you give the designs to, to the Nello guys, they're doing it from home, sending it in, and, and no, nobody's getting too close at the factory. Normally, as I say, you've got 200 people working an eight hour shift, now they split into uh, four shifts so that it's, that it's, that it's much easier and, and we're not having problems. So the, the orders are going out, everything's actually stayed exactly the same. They're lucky in Portugal, it's not a proper lockdown. Restaurants are closed, um, takeaways are allowed and, and my friend Tiago Campos, who's my neighbor, has actually opened up his restaurant yesterday. I haven't had a report back how busy it was. So he's doing takeaway chicken, uh, Alta Villa, nice, nice lot. Oh, okay. So, now we're going to go into the next thing. We've been asked a few questions before you actually arrive, and, and I'm going to go straight on to that is, and, and this is the interesting thing, paddle length. Paddle length. Paddle length is one of those things that, oh, no, everybody talks about paddle length, and then I'm going to go to a feather angle, and then I'm going to do a little bit more teaching. Okay, so the first thing is paddle length. Paddle length is a strange and difficult uh, part of paddling. Everybody, you've got all these experts that know how, 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 how tall your paddle should be or how long your paddle should be. The bottom line is, in the old days they said, no, no, it's got to be on the tips of your fingers. Can you see that? So, obviously, this is my paddle that I race. I've raced many races. I've done the Malacca, I've done the Fish River Marathon, I've done all the, those races. You can see that this paddle, if it was according to the old method of you just put your fingers over, it would be way too short. In fact, it's on the shortest thing, and this is an adjustable paddle. So let's see if I can make it long enough. Oh, no, so this, this, according to the experts, this wouldn't work for me. But you can still see that I'm actually too tall for this. Okay, but the real way to decide what paddle length you have to be, you have to take a lot of things into consideration. Number one, how strong you are. Of course, if you're very strong, you can pull a bigger paddle. Then, how tall you are. Then you go on your technique. Have you got a low slung technique, a high slung technique? Then how wide your boat is. If your boat's this wide, you won't even be able to put the paddle in if it's too short. And then a narrow boat, and then your seat height. How high your seat is makes a big difference. The higher your seat is, the longer your paddle has to be. So all these factors, and then you start going, how long am I going to race? I'm going to race for 500 meters or 500 kilometers. Obviously, all these these uh, uh, permutations you have to work out to see what paddling. Okay. But the strangest thing that we've had, we've been doing, and obviously I've been paddling for a long time, we always had fixed length. There was no such thing as an adjustable. The adjustment systems came out in about 1998, around there, I think. Uh, Greg Barton, I think, designed the uh, adjustments in 98 or 97. So, in my day, it was very simple. My father gave me a paddle that he used. I was small-ish, not completely, and weak-ish, not really weak. When I started, when I was a young guy, he gave me a paddle, and in those days it was 90 degrees left feather. Left feather means there was left control, as opposed to most people around the world, especially in the, in the Western world, use right feather. But even the right feather people all had 90 degrees. Okay. So we're going to work about, after, we're going to talk about feather just now, but let's talk about paddling. So, you've worked out all these paddle lengths, and it's just like getting on a bicycle. And why the bicycle is that when you set up a bicycle, they, they adjust the saddle, they adjust the, the, the ride height, they adjust all these things, and then you cycle with it, and you realize, oh, no, this is killing my back, or this is killing my shoulders, and then you adjust it. It's the same thing paddling. Once you've got your paddling, by rights, by rights, you should be able to change it. And when this paddle uh, um, adjustment was uh, developed by Greg Barton all those years ago, that's when we should have said, oh, this is a light bulb moment. Well, I did. Unlike most people, I'm not a follower. 
when I saw this paddle that was adjusted, I was racing the Molokai and, and uh, Greg Barton had these fancy paddles and I said I want one. And then he, the, the thing that really bugged me is that he charged me. I'd already won Molokai six or seven times and he said, no, no, you have to pay. I said, hey, I'm world champion. Anybody else, they would give me and pay me, but I had to pay. And, I, and again, it just shows you, if you spend money on educating yourself and getting the best, sometimes the best equipment that's completely new, you can improve. So the big thing with the Molokai that I really I re realized right from the beginning is that I'm racing downwind, going 18, 19 kilometers an hour, surfing downwind in this Molokai, beautiful, beautiful water, surfing and then when you turn the corner at Waikai, coming into a Waikai, the wind that you were chasing and having fun with is straight into you at 20 to 30 knots. Now your speed goes from 18 to 9 kilometers an hour. How the hell can you be in the same gear at 9 kilometers? So I used to do it in the old days, it was like a hose camp. So I used to do this, waves 20 and 30 foot width and I used to be doing that making my paddle shorter and shorter and shorter. So I always finish the marker, you look, look at all, all uh, old photographs, with my paddle on the shortest it could go, 210. Look at this. So now this is how much too short this paddle is supposed to be for me. But the people didn't realize, the people didn't realize is that once they had this adjustment, it opened up a whole new efficient way of paddling. But not many people took it on. So for many years, I was adjusting my paddle and people were saying, Oh, no, you're crazy. How can it work? I said, listen, it's very simple. In 1906, funny enough, 1906 was the first ever Tour de France. And in those days, they used to wear the hats like that, remember? They used to have their, their tires around here and off they went. And you'll see a lot of photographs and a lot of uh, old movies where they're pushing their bicycles up the hill. And in those days, they also, and, and, and that mad men, all the smokers, in 1906, they used to smoke. Because smoking helped their chest. Can you believe it? That was a fact. And when they ran into the, into the, into the stores there, little cafes, they were drinking wine and beer. That was their energy drinks. Now they've got really strong stuff. And the interesting thing, the reason why they're pushing up these steep hills is simple. They only had one gear. I've subsequently found out at those beginning early Tour de France's is that they actually used to keep a, a, a one spanner with them and they used to take the front cog and put it in the back cog. So they actually had two gears. So when they went down that hill again, they could fly changing those two. So they had two gears in the early age. But you can imagine nowadays they've got 27 gears, whatever. And, and, and it's such an easy thing to see is that in paddling it's exactly the same. Your front cog is the size of your blade, your size of your blade, okay? So the bigger your blade is, the harder it is to pull through the water, the more powerful. So that's why the big blade guys, or the big cog in the front of your bicycle, and this is your small cog in the, your back cogs. And here you've got 10 gears, and here it's very difficult to change your, your paddle uh, blade in mid-race. So that's not going to happen. So what you're going to do is you're going to decide what kind of paddling you're doing. If you're doing sprinting, you're going to have a big blade here and a big blade here. If you're doing long distance paddling like I do, you have a small blade. This happens to be a bracha for 735 centimeters. Very nice all round paddle for downwind paddling, for river paddling, for long distance paddling. And again, if I do do a sprint, all I do is make my paddle longer. It's funny in, in, in Sydney, the Sydney Olympics, uh, the wind howls there, and in that regatta course there, the wind was really howling. So, in those days, again, no adjustments. So that for the first time, one of the first and only times, the 500 meter paddler, the 1000 meter paddler won the 500 because the 1000 meter, which normally takes in those days 335, 340, was taking 345, and the 500 meters, which takes 135, 140, was taking close to two minutes. So understand the guys take off with the same length paddle and they can't pull it through the water. And what happened is Knut Hol Holman won the 1000 and the 500 because the guy, he came past everybody at the last bit because he's used to doing 1000 meters, which is closer. So understand that if they just change their paddle, because the bottom line is, it's very simple, and you'll, the counter argument is, no, I don't change my paddling. I'd rather have 25 different techniques 
I'd rather have 25 different techniques and have the same paddling. Where I'd like to go with the cyclists and what I do is I'd rather have one good cadence that I work on all the time and the only thing I do is change my paddling to fit in how I feel. There's no way that you feel the same after, say I did an 80 kilometer paddle, the next day I am promise you you're not going to feel as strong as the day before. So then you, you get in your boat and you change your paddling according to your strength. Many a races, I'll arrive at the race, I'll do my, my drills, feel the paddling, then I'll change it. Oh, I'm not feeling so strong. I thought I was. Uh, I think they gave me too much wine there, clear. So I've got to change that and make it smaller. And then go again. Oh, now I'm still feeling bad. I'll start a race and I might have changed my paddling two or three times. I start the race, I take off. And then I realize, shoot, my paddle's still too long. I will change it again. Okay. So you, there's no fixed length. And some days you're going to feel, shoo, I feel strong and make it longer. So when you're going downwind, you make it longer. So if I'm averaging 18, 19 kilometers an hour, I'm going to get a longer paddle to give me a slower cadence, the same cadence because I'm going 18 kilometers, as opposed to when I go against the, the, the wind, I'm going to make it as short as possible. So what basically happens is exactly the same as a bicycle. Everything stays the same. Remember, we want to be... 90 degrees, everything stays the same. So you'll see that as the paddle gets shorter, you end up holding the blades right in the end. That's no big deal. So in, in, a, in a microcosm way, when your paddle's long, look where it goes in there. And then as it goes shorter, it just comes in a little bit less along the boat. This is along the boat. So it just comes in a little bit less every stroke. And, and, and everything else stays exactly the same. It's just like a crank on your bicycle. When you're pedaling along and you change gear, it feels funny for a few things. Oh, I think I'm in the wrong gear. You get used to it and the same thing happens when you paddle. When you change your paddling, it feels funny to start off with and then it becomes normal. So that's what you want. So paddle length is very simple. Never say that I ah, ah, only paddle 220. How can that be? You're never going to feel the same every single day. So play around with it. Again, play around with it. And again, to change your paddle length, you must practice that in a race. I never forget, I was paddling in, uh, and, and the, my Portuguese friend will remember, I was paddling in Setubal or Sisimbra. Sisimbra. I was in Sisimbra and I was racing against Lionel Romalho, who's the top marathon paddler in Portugal and one of the top paddlers in, in, the, in the world, marathon paddlers, and he loves surski paddling. So I said, no, no, Lionel, when you go against the wind, just make your paddle shorter. It was actually a flat day, thank God, a little bit of bump, just enough for me to compete against these guys. And, and, and on the finish, we were sprinting and I just beat him on the flat water so he never heard the end of it. The flat water race and I beat Lionel. And then after he said, hey, gee, you won't believe what happened. I changed my paddle length, I fell out. I said, that's, that's not my fault. You've got to practice it. And remember, my saying is always, this, always the same. If you're going to change paddle length, make sure you brace and then change. Always brace. Never have your paddle out the water to change paddle length. Okay. Never do this, which I see all the time when the people are wobbling like this. You don't have to do it. Paddle on the water, open it, change the paddle length. Okay. So you never put the paddle in there. Make sure it's always on the water. That's very important. Okay. The next thing is the feather. <coughs> feather angle was invented ages ago. Remember, in the Eskimos. The Eskimos had very thin paddles. Those Greenland paddles, they had no feather on them. And the reason why they had no feather on them because they were so thin that when they paddled against the water, against the wind, it made no difference. When they called these Euro blades or flat blades, as they're called, what happened was is they tried to avoid the, 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 the resistance of the wind, so they made them all at 90 degrees. So our, my paddle, I paddled for many years at 90 degrees. So when my paddle was in there, it cut through the wind, I put it in there, and I had to turn my wrist like this and cut through the wind that side again. As, as we went along, and again, the reason why I'm actually left feather, or was left feather, is that my father used to give you a paddle, there was no adjustment, give the paddle to you, and it was left feather, whatever length, and off you went, and you just w w turned left, 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 at 90 degrees. Nobody even thought about it. Nobody even thought about it. In fact, there's a couple of races in, in South Africa, we, in the life-saving, uh, I'll never forget, 
uh, obviously he's doing an Ironman and somebody gave me a paddle and, they, and it would be right feather, then I'd have to go and try and paddle right feather, which is very difficult. And, and especially if you're trying to race and to be fast. So, feather came about purely to cut through the wind. Now, to cut through the wind. Okay. As I, as I, as I got better and as I f felt what worked for me, I was on 75 left. So that's what I was eventually at, 75 left. And I was always teaching, all the time. All the time I was teaching and saying, hey, this feather is a strange thing. I mean, I have to do this all day or this all day. And if you paddle long distance races and, and, and the South Africans watching will know that Fort Elizabeth East London race, which is 240 kilometers, the first day is like 75 kilometers. And, and if you're paddling into a wind, in our day, we used to paddle into the wind. So I'll never forget the one year Herman and I finished in eight hours with the winning time. And most of the people finished in 12, 13 hours. If you do 12, 13 hours like this, you should have seen the people's wrists and all this problem. said, what is this? When the wing paddle came, it should have been, came around, it should have been so, hey guys, this is amazing. This wing paddle, whether it's like this, or whether it's like this, there's absolutely no wind problem. There's no wind problem with the wing. You can test it yourself. You can go as hard as you like, and it makes no difference. So, when that came about, what should have happened, we should have been on zero. Because the funny thing is, and I'm teaching all over the world, I see so many people, especially right feather paddles, they put this paddle in the water, like this for bracing. Have a look at that. There's a good brace. Who is it? I don't know, darling. Right. Okay, so when you go for a brace stroke here, and this is all your right feather paddlers, and you go for a brace stroke on the right hand side, look what happens. The paddle's like this, and what happens? Most people fall out on the right hand side because of this feather angle. Okay, so there's a feather angle, we sit there, we brace nicely on this side, but when we go here, we fall out. And the joke about this, and believe me, I've been coaching a lot of people, is that when we brace on the right hand side, we fall out on the right hand side, and most people can only remount on the left hand side. Can you believe that? So they have to swim under the boat and remount. As opposed to the same thing on the other side, if you do the other side, there, brace this side, when I go this side, I fall out. Okay. So that's why the the the... the Another reason not to have a feather is that when I go for my, and again, you can practice, and obviously I can practice, and I've done it many times, is that when I go for my brace, it's like this and not like this. So you have to actually make sure that you brace and concentrate on how you move your wrists. Okay. So when you're on zero, when you're on zero, look at the difference. When I brace this side, and I feel unstable, and I go to brace this side, it's still really flat. Same on this side. When I go this side or this side, I'm stable. Because the most important part of padding, and we're going to get into that later on, is being stable. So on zero feather, and believe me, I don't care what anybody says out there, there's absolutely no difference. Because when I'm padding like this, and it's taken me two and a half years to get from 75 left to zero, and now I've been padding zero for maybe a year and a half, it's so much easier. <coughs> It's so much easier because the bottom line is I don't have to think. When I brace, I don't have to think about anything. And when I'm paddling, it's all natural. I just let it go. The paddle goes in the water. There's a small, small bit of uh, movement on your wrist, not a huge amount of movement on your wrist, and, and you save your wrists. There's absolutely no benefit of a feather. And, and I can see it. I can see it slowly happening. It's funny how things take a long time. I can see that this, some of the 200 meter paddlers are working out. Why well, then this, doing this on a 200 meters, they're getting slow, uh, uh, less and less feather, 15, 20 degrees. So it, it, it's interesting. When I decided to go zero, because I've been teaching zero for the whole time, I said, I'm going to just go from 75 to zero. No, it wasn't that easy. You, you don't understand how much muscle memory is there. So it's taken me a long time. So I went from like 45, then 30 then 10, then the last little bit, the, from the 10 degrees, took me ages to eventually uh, get it down to, uh, down to zero. But once you're on zero, believe you me, paddling becomes so easy. You never have to worry, you don't have to think it's always there, it's always the brace strokes there, and when you're pulling, you don't have to worry about it. And the funny thing is, when you're going downward now, when you're going downward, you've got two little carts here that are pulling you along. Two little carts pulling you along, so that even makes it more fun. And again, against the wind, you don't even feel it at all. Believe me, th this wing paddle works absolutely fine. Okay, so that, again, 
Also, on, 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 the, on, the, on the zero feather, a lot of people have taken it. I know. I see people. When I see a person starting for the first time, it's so easy. In fact, I was in uh, Narrabian Lake uh, uh, and I was teaching there with uh, um, Kenny Wallace was there and, and um, Matt was there. And, and, and the guys listening say, oh, it's zero thing. Because if everybody goes and they get, they get their surf ski to go and test the first time they get into the sport, first thing they do is put it on 60 right, which is a normal thing, and they get in and they pull out. So this guy, uh, one of Matt's workers there, Matt Mandel's workers there, said, okay, I'm going to try this. He gave the, the guy zero paddle, wing paddle, and off the guy paddled. He said, it's the first time ever that he's had a person jumping in a surf ski and paddling off, and it's just because of the zero it was a guy, I didn't have to think about it. I see it when, when and, and, it, and it actually makes me so cross when I see new newbies. I see them in my club there and, and, and Villa de Con, all got feathers and they're all watching this paddle because they can't. It's like it's so stupid when all you have to do is put it on zero and the person's like, oh, is this how you paddle? And off you go. And then you can work on technique and not worrying about worrying about where the paddle is. It's so stupid, but it's amazing. People will go down that route still and they'll still argue. No matter how much you beat them, it's still a strange thing. It's like, it's like the, the adjustment uh, thing. In fact, two years ago in Portugal, I was sitting next to um, Ivan commentating on the doubles race. And I said, oh, look at there. There's Andy Burkett and Hank have just changed their paddling. Oh, Ivan said, no way. You've got to be kidding me. No way. Spoke to uh, Hank and Andy after. He says, of course. I couldn't pull my paddle through. It changed my paddle length and it changed my race. And it's funny, I mean, I, I better tell you the story because it, it involves uh, Joe Glickman. This is 10 or 15 years ago, I was doing the, the race in Natchez, Mississippi. Natchez, Mississippi was like an 80 kilometer flat water race. I like 80 kilometer flat water races like a hole in my ass, a head, I mean. And I thought, gee, this is going to be tough. And I'm actually paddling in a double. So we all get in these school bikes, we wake up at 5 o'clock and we drive the 80 kilometers up to the start. We get in these yellow school bikes and obviously all the guys there, uh, it was uh, Craig Impens, Don, uh, all these guys were all, all, all asking me, hey Oscar, what are you going to do? And I'm paddling with this guy who won my, the seat in, a, in the back of my double, who's never seen a wing paddle, has never done more than 20 kilometers. I knew it was going to be a tough race. Get in that bus and I said, oh, so how are you going to handle this? He said, no, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at 217, so I'm going to start at 217, and every hour I'm going to reduce my paddle length by two centimeters just so I can just keep my cadence going the same way. And, and I never forget Joe Glickman, oh no, no, why would you do that? Uh, geez, you, you, you're crazy, you're crazy. I mean, no, I'm not gonna change anything. I said, I'm just telling you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do it. After the race, I had a good race, and I, obviously I finished at, at 210, all the way down. The, around a few beers, every one of those guys came in, hey Oscar, you won't believe it. I tried your method, what a pleasure. Let me tell you, when you're paddling for four hours, I don't care how good you are, Rather change your paddle length than change your technique. Much easier to stick to one technique. Okay, uh, Claire, we had a few questions. I'll do a few questions before I go into my yeah? Just there's one here from Steen Falk. How do you get adjusted to less feather without turning the hand? Do you tape hands to shaft? Oh, no, you never, you never tape your hands to shaft. Remember at the beginning, uh, always keep your hands very loose. This, this wing paddle will always go in the perfect way and do its own thing. You don't need to hold it tight. So you just got to get used to it because what actually happens is that you're so used to doing, like me, I'm so used to doing this, it becomes second nature. Remember, it takes about 10,000 hours or 10,000 movements to change a habit into a new habit. So that's, it just takes you time. The only way is to slowly change it, slowly change it, and don't worry about it. Let the paddle Hold, be in your hand very lightly. So it's very easy. Keep it nice and loose and, and, and let the paddle do the work and don't grip the paddle. Hold it very loose. So I hold it actually like that and not like that. Okay, so very easy. Okay, so we've covered the, the, the paddle length, the, 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 the feather angle. You don't need feather. Believe you me, it's an absolute way. And paddle length, just get a paddle. If, you, if you're strong, you go from 210 to 220. If you're slightly weaker, 190 to 195. And Bracha and all these people make paddles perfectly adjustable. And it becomes easy, but you must practice doing your adjustments. Okay. So now when you get into 
paddling, and this is any type of paddling, and, I, and it bugs me to see. And again, I, this is for beginners, the best, everybody, but funny enough, even the best don't do it right. The first and most important part of paddling, and the, the, the part that's going to make you have much more fun, is the brace stroke. Okay, the brace stroke is the most important stroke in all kinds of paddling. I don't care what you do. The brace stroke is, and again, I've, I've perfected this, is your right hand on your left knee, shaft at 45 degrees, and you can actually open your hand. Okay, so the brace stroke. Why is the brace stroke the most important stroke in paddling? Because if you can't perfect the brace stroke, you'll be doing another sport called swimming. And those people that are starting the sport will realize that you swim quite often when you start it. Unless you get the perfect boat, which is nice and stable, and you don't swim. But still, no matter how stable your boat is, this is the stroke you've got to remember, the brace stroke. Because the brace stroke is the most important for a few reasons. Number one, it keeps your balance. So all you have to do is put your right hand and your left knee in. That, what that does, doing this, is makes your bl this blade go far out. The further out that blade is, the more stable you are in big waves and things like that. To do a brace like this, you've only got this much uh, helping you. The further out there, it's, it's like a, a tripod, the more stable. So that's the first thing, it keeps you stable. The second thing is, the brace stroke is the most relaxed stroke. You'll see, when they start the Olympics, which has been uh, postponed for a year, most people are waiting like this to start paddling. It's the most relaxed stroke. My shoulders are down, my hands are down, I can even open my hands. I don't even need to grip the paddle, because this paddle will just skim across the water when I'm going. So the brace stroke is the most relaxed stroke. And the most important part of the brace stroke, it also starts the forward stroke. So from here, as opposed to people that do this and then put the paddle, do this and put it, from here, all you do is you go into your forward stroke. So from this brace stroke, this is a left brace stroke, into your forward stroke. You can see, so the time that your paddle blades out the water is much less than doing one of these. And there. Okay. So if you're doing it correctly, you can see that my shaft, as I told you yesterday, is parallel with my chest, which you want, and then I go into the forward stroke. Yeah. And on the same, on this side, left hand, right knee, 45 degrees. 45 degrees is very important, okay? If you do a brace stroke like this, what happens is when the wave hits you, it hits this blade and hits it into your chest, and you can break your paddle shaft in half, especially doing a miller's run. I never forget, uh, Dale Lipstra said he was going along like this, and what happened was that I went down the wave, and then obviously a bit of the sea came, hit him, and he snapped his paddle around his chest, and then off we went and paddled back in. Okay, so 45 degrees, so when a wave hits, the, the paddle does this. Okay, so remember, from here, the forward stroke is the the, the start from a brace stroke. Much better from a brace stroke and not doing it this way because you messed up very from here, it's parallel and in I go to the stroke. Okay. So the brace stroke is something you should practice and I always, in, in my notes, always spend the first five or ten minutes of a session practicing a brace stroke. And all you do is paddle one, two, three, four, five, brace. On the brace, a few pointers you need to know. Number one, you must learn, as you get better, to open your hands. Because this is the time you rest. Especially when you're going down a big wave, this is the time you rest. So you open it. Okay. Then, that's, that's important. Okay. Then, the brace stroke, as you, you must put your weight, your body weight, and your boat must be lean, tilted slightly onto the brace. So you're actually using the brace to give you support. Okay, it's going to give you support. The further out, the better. And then you paddle five strokes, and then this side. Remember, lean left, brace left, and you can even turn left just to see, because if you lean like this, your boat automatically will turn a little bit, which is great for going down runs and, and, and learning how to do down. Same thing on the other side. Brace right, lean right, turn right. But make sure your boat just Tilt it a little bit to one side, so you've got the power to keep you uh, up. So you should be able to get good. As you get better, then you do the hello brace, which is basically, you, you, you can put your hand like that, open your hand, take your hand off, notice the paddle's still on the water, but I can say hello, and wave to the crowds, 
wave to Table Mountain, the people going up the Table Mountain, and put it back there. Okay, and you should be able to do that on both sides equally as well. There, and wave, and say, okay, I've done it. So the brace stroke is important, and it leads you on to the forward stroke. Okay, that's very important. Okay, now the forward stroke. Can I just interrupt? Yes, yes. Round shaft or oval? Okay, so it's interesting, round shaft or oval. That was an interesting thing that uh, a lot of companies have got uh, round shafts and a lot of companies have got oval shafts. As you get better, the most important part of being round and oval is that you should be the same on both sides. I see so many people, if they write feather, they put an oval part to side and a round part to side. That is so stupid because when I looked at my hands, they both look exactly the same. So whatever you've got on this side, you will have on this side. Okay, so... Whether you're having round or oval, the same thing. And if you hold your paddle nice and lightly, oval or round shouldn't make a big difference. Okay, shouldn't make a big difference. But whatever you do, it must be the same this side as that side. Okay, so make sure, because you shouldn't be gripping the paddle. And just, if you can zoom in there, look at there, you can see I hold it like that. So it's not even, I'm there not gripping it. Okay, don't grip it, make it loose. Okay. Because understand, from that brace stroke, the looser you have your hands, the looser your body is, the looser your hands are going to be on the next catch stroke. Okay. Any other questions there coming in? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. How many people have got in the top right there? Okay. 144. A lot of people. Can you imagine 144 people in this flat? <laughs> What's that? Okay. Okay. Now we're going to go into the forward stroke. I mean, we've got, in, in fact, we've only got... Uh, 18 minutes left. Let's do a few questions. And I, I know the one question I got earlier on, Claire, was um, when I paddle hard, I seem to rub on my coccyx here because I'm using my legs so well. Okay. Understand how paddling actually works. As the better you get at this paddling, the more important it is that to realize that when I put this paddle in, there into the water, most people, let's take this out of the way, most people end up pulling the paddle back and they only go a little bit forward. You see that? Let me do that again. They put the paddle in the water and normally, only up to here, put it in. And then when they pull back, the paddle comes back and they only go a little bit forward. Okay. So, what we're trying to do on the perfect stroke, and this is to avoid, and now watch what happens. I'm going to show you head on and then side on. I put this paddle in, I lock it in. And if I lock this paddle in and I drive forward, I go forward and the blade doesn't come back. That's why the best paddlers in the world have got a very low cadence. They put the paddle in and they lock it into the water and then they pull themselves past. That's why they can have a very short stroke, but they're moving a long way. Let me show you from the side so you can see. So this is what the, the paddlers that think they're doing very well and they've got a high cadence, they put the paddle in. Instead, and again, only half the blade goes in, and instead of the paddle, they get pull a little bit, and they move a little bit forward, because the blade's coming back. Okay, have a look at it. Go in, they put it in, and then the blade comes back, and they move, you can see, a little bit forward. What we want to do, and you can see, and i try and get this right, is we go like that, in, right, there, and then this paddle gets locked in, and if I drive my body forward, so understand, it's more like pole vaulting. So how can you get a sore bum here if you're trying to pull your bum off the seat? So that's one of the, the tips you want to do. I think there was Paul Stokes in, in Dubai that was teaching some new people that are changing from SUP to, uh, to Sursky, getting a sore bum. You've got to think about it. And again, it's, not, it's going to be difficult. And in the next uh, lesson, I'm going to teach you how to, to perfect your forward stroke with a whole lot of uh, drills and how, how to practice them. But, so what you're trying to do is pull your bum off the seat. If I pull my bum off the seat, my bum is connected to my feet, which is driving the boat forward. And again, so, so this is the back of your seat. You're trying to pull your bum off, but your feet are pushing the boat, so it goes together. But you don't want to be pushing it hard. The harder you push back into the back of your seat, the less you can rotate, okay? The less you can rotate. So if you push very hard into the back of the seat, you can't rotate, and then obviously you get chafing. And I see a lot of people that have got big butt pads behind the back of their boat. When I do, and again, I, I make mistakes, uh, I get a, a hole in my ass in the wrong place, I have the same problem. 
and I, and I leave it there raw to realize, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. Because if I'm pushing in the back of my seat, where's my boat going? It's definitely not going forward. I don't care what scientific uh, uh, courses you've done. If you push into the back of a seat, this boat is actually going backwards. Okay? Then I've got question. another question here from Steen. I think that's how you pronounce his name. How about shaft thickness, especially big hands? Okay, so a good question. What shaft thickness do you use? Okay, and, and, and the best answer to that is that I've got really big hands. I'm probably double XL in my golf swing. So I've got really big hands. So it makes not really difference because once, once you, once you uh, get used to holding the paddle like this as opposed to like this, the thickness doesn't make too much difference. I mean, you just hold it there. I mean, this is a lot thicker than a golf shaft. And it's probably similar to a tennis shaft, you know. So this is fairly thick anyway when it comes to that sport. Golf, golf uh, the only guy is Bryce, Bryson DeChambeau who's got thick golf clubs, uh, golf grips like this. Most guys have got much thinner golf grips, even with a double or triple XL hand. So the shaft thickness doesn't make a, a big difference. What it does do, uh, very thick shafts end up making much stiffer blades. So when you're doing, when you're doing a, a long distance races you actually want nice flexible uh, shafts so it doesn't impact your your all your joints and, and your and your shoulders and all those problems okay then the next one from chloe on a really long ski race where you won't have portages like flat water how do you prevent dead leg okay good question how do you prevent dead leg dead legs always because you're sitting in the same place for a long time. So the big and important thing to do on these flat water races, and mainly people get it in, in K1s, a lot of dead legs on these long races, no portages. It's, it's something that you really have to work on. The big thing is to try and pull and then really concentrate when you rotate around, is to try and pull your whole bum off the seat, off the seat. So you relieve and let, let, let the, the blood flow there. So, You've got to try and do that all the time. So if you start getting dead leg, that's what you're going to do. You're going to start moving those legs a lot. And you'll see when I paddle, I've never had a problem with dead leg. You've got to move your legs a lot. And uh, most people make the fundamental mistake of putting butt pads down. And butt pads, what a butt pad does is it's exactly like your door on your, on your car. If you've got two rubber parts pushing together, they make a perfect seal. But if you've got a hard and a soft, invariably doesn't make a perfect seal which stops the dead leg so if i ever get dead leg the first thing i do is throw away my butt pads even if you've got a skinny ass you want no butt pads so you can really rotate far more than you should in, uh, uh, than you than you would and really pull your bum off the seat because i know the only time i, I get dead leg is if i'm sitting in the toilet too long uh, reading or or doing something like that i get dead leg because i know and i can feel it it's pushing staying in the same place for too long a time, that's how you get the dead leg. So really move your bum, try and pull yourself off the seat, that's going to stop uh, dead leg. Next question from David Rivel. What difference does blade size make? Good question. What difference does blade size make? Again, obviously, just like your bicycle, you can always sometimes go in the big gear and the small gear in the back. It's the same on a, on a paddle blade. The bigger your blade, the harder it is to pull through the water. So invariably, your 200 meter paddle is going to have a big blade and a long blade and a long shaft. So some of the 200 meter paddlers, they're going 220 with a Bracha 1, the biggest blade. So they go 220. I'm, I'm not strong enough to pull 220 even with this. Maybe after all the steroids tomorrow, I could maybe pull a Bracha 1 at two, 210 maybe. But so what you say is this determines how powerful you are. So the big blades are invariably there for the 200, 500 and 1000 meter paddlers. You won't find people paddling, although they did. I mean, it was funny that Clint Robinson for a while in, in the Molokai's, till he saw the light, always paddled with a very big shaft. And maybe that's why Clint Robinson's only got three Molokai's and I've got 12. Because he went for this big blade, big shaft, fixed length, and at the end, uh, too tired, couldn't manage to pull it off, you know. so. Rather go, if you want more power and you've got a smaller blade, just make your paddle length longer. That's, that's what I'd say. But if you're on a 200 or 1,000 or 500 meter paddler, you have to make a big blade 
and a long paddle. So both together. Next question. What degree the feather reaches the catch position compared to the boat to inertia the pull? Okay, that's a good question because I didn't even cover it because I'll cover that later on. Now, all these people with these feather angles, what happens, and I see it, believe me, I see it, even the top paddlers, they do their feather and they, they say they're 67.2. That's all absolute nonsense, okay? Because what happens is the most important part of the catch is to get your blade in at 90 degrees. 90 degrees here? Yeah? Because what you are doing, as I told you, you're putting a weight here and you're pulling yourself over. Now, if your paddle blade is like this and you put weight on it, you're going to fall out. Or you're going to compensate. So a lot of people, on the one side, they put it in it, and let's have a look here, they put it in at 90 degrees, because they, they, that's their normal side. And when they come here, they put it in like this. And they think, no, I'm on 60 degrees. Absolute nonsense. That's not 90 degrees. 90 degrees is that. I'm showing you there. That's 90 degrees. So when I push down on my paddle, when I push down and I've got full power and the blade's going to go out. If I push down on it here, it's going to cut underneath the blade. So I want to be at 90 degrees when I put this blade in. That's why when I hear people, they've got this degrees and that's absolute nonsense. If your one blade is going in like, and again, I'm showing you here, 90 degrees, perfect. And then they come across the other side, they change their feather and then they put it in this side. How stupid is that? Now, to get it perfect, you want to be like that. So both sides should be at 90 degrees to the boat. This is the edge of the boat, and you want to be at 90 degrees, and you want to be at 90 degrees. Perfect. So that's so many people, I find that they actually haven't, most people don't rotate enough, so their palade ends up like this, and they have to do, you should be doing more. Easiest way to do that is make less feather. So that's the first start. So you know, most people that are on 60 are actually paddling at 45. They don't even know it. So if you went to 45, oh, see, my blades are now more symmetrical. Most people you'll see, uh, even some of uh, my learner's friends, you'll see Dean Gardner, he's always got a limp in his paddle. That's why one side's better than the other side. If you've got a limp in your blade, one side's better than the other side. So try and get it absolutely perfect on both sides, being at 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. Next question, hand to shoulder drill. At what point do you then straighten your arm on the forward stroke and not end up compromising your body turn? Okay, so uh, as I say, we're going to be covering that later. We've got five minutes. I'll do this. Will be maybe the last question. The most important part is when we drive forward, we drive forward like this and not like that. And we are all, as we come out, a lot of people come out and the elbows up here, they start pushing forward. So what you want to do is keep this distance always the same and again looking at the big picture my chest is like that there and i drive forward notice what happens to my body and look what happens if i don't do it right no body movement okay so it's from there to there so now what i always say and i'll work this on the next time you don't have to as as you get better yes there and you can do that but even for me if i'm teaching somebody new all i want them is to get into this position and drop the paddle in and then use the body. It's still parallel. Because as soon as I say stretch forward or do that something forward, this is what happened. Okay, I'll do that. And notice no body. So you really want to concentrate from there is to keep it always parallel. So there's a lot of ways to, to make it work for you. There's always a little tip on how to make it good for you. Either keep the pat your shaft parallel or watch this top hand and don't let it go away. So don't let it go away from you. And again, this is not rotation okay this is not rotation this is rotation and again this is how much you go and off it goes in and as you get better you can go stretch a little bit far further don't stretch forward because i can guarantee most people when they stretch forward negate their body turn negate their rotation so if, as soon as you start thinking about this you don't think about this okay so that's what happens okay We've got five minutes. Is there another? Okay. okay. We've got five minutes just to, to wrap up. So this will be the, the weekly lesson. And obviously I'm going to go into the technique. Get your friends to watch. Those people that are always thinking about getting into a new sport. This is one sport you can do for life. As I say, I started when I was six or seven years old. And I've been doing it all my life. And it's low impact, easy to do. But it's always the important thing in life is to get the right and the correct coaching. No use going down that road, and I've got a lot of people out there, uh, I, can, I, can, I should be name and shame them, who spend their life paddling and they never get faster because 
they only thinking of getting training, training, training. They don't even spend time like this watching videos. They know everything. And those are the people that are, are rather gracious and say there's 500 people and I come top 10. How does a 57 year old beat the other 480 people? Those 480 people should be listening and learning, but they don't. They all know too much. Okay, and the way I teach, I like you to understand it. So that's why the next uh, lesson, make sure that you've got your questions because nothing I teach here is just summed up. Everything is thought out for myself to make me better and which makes you better. So I've also got an online coaching uh, app that you can, with training tools, it's called coachchalupski.com. Just go in there and see there's all the videos actually there. I've actually got water, which is a little bit better than here. There's no water, not too much water here, but it's still a good place to be. Um, and in these times, remember, you've got to be safe out there. Don't be silly. A lot of places around the world have, have uh, allowed people to go out, but as long as you are very clear on what you're doing, don't interact, keep your social distancing, especially, and again, I have to mention that anybody, all your friends that have got cancer, please make sure you don't go near them because they are compromised. All the old people, uh, Claire's mother is 87, so she's got to be very careful. As I say, it's, it's supposed to be uh, very bad for older people, but I see they've had some deaths with younger people as well. So don't think you're a hero. Stay at home. If I can stay home in this little flat, uh, I think most people can uh, manage when they've got a little garden or a brand or something out there. There's a lot of things to do out there. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun and now hopefully you've all learnt and, and next week we'll have a bigger class. How many, how many in our class, Claire? 146. 146 people at once. That's fantastic uh, learning. Remember, the only way to beat this uh, virus is to stop it, isolate, uh, don't mix with anybody. And the next way is to beat the bulge, because I've seen a lot of uh, jokes about after three weeks of no exercise, people are going to be very large. That doesn't need to, ha doesn't need to uh, happen. Uh, two great audio books I suggest, uh, Obesity Code by Dr. Jason Fung, very good book. Very practical. He's a nephrologist from Canada who's out of uh, Taiwan, I think. So, very clever nephrologist, so he knows his stuff. Um, another book, as I say, I'm listening to uh, Real Meal on, on, on Trial. Very good book. Another good book is Keto Clarity, so you understand how ketosis works. It's a very interesting concept. It's something that people should learn about. And you've got time now. You've got time. Listen to these books. It's, it's fun. I mean, I've listened to them three or four times. I mean, I can mention a, a, a few more, Brain Drain. All these books are really fantastic. When you read them, you actually get so upset of what we've put our bodies through. And uh, so, sign off for uh, next time. Uh, same time, same place. It's probably going to be a little bit uh, darker when we start. But uh, next time, we're going to go through the forward stroke. Uh, from the forward stroke, we're going to show you how to perfect it. And again, you don't need any water. The most important thing is technique. Technique's going to make you faster. Uh, not all that time training. And at the moment, nobody can train. So I'm feeling an advantage at the moment. Uh, eat properly. Stay safe. Uh, make sure that you uh, watch this video again. Because you won't believe how much you'll miss of the few tips uh, I gave today. Uh, Till next time. Thank you very much. And see you next week. Hi there, thanks for listening, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if you want to join Oscar's club or get access to his free technique video series, you can do that by visiting coachchalupski.com.